Um, I'm, um, for those of you who aren't yet familiar with the Israel Asia Center, uh, the Israel Asia Center is an in Israeli independent, not-for-profit organization dedicated to informing, empowering, and connecting the Israel Asia leaders of tomorrow towards building a more sustainable future in the Asian century. Uh, we ra run a, a range of uh, public education and thought leadership events, as well as leadership programs focused on building future leaders in Israel-Asia relations. Um, just highlighting one of our programs, we run an annual Israel-Indonesia Futures program, bringing together emerging and established leaders from Israel and Indonesia for high-level networking, mutual understanding, and partnership building. And we're going to be announcing details of that uh, 20 of our 2024 program uh, shortly on our website and through our newsletter. Um, so um, today's briefing is an opportunity to learn more about the current situation in Israel, about the Israel-Gaza conflict and implications for normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia and ultimately Indonesia. Um, and there'll also be an opportunity uh, to ask questions. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, please note that while today's session is being recorded, no one's names will be including in, cl included in the recording. Uh, it will be uh, for it will just be recording the speakers only. Uh, we'll begin with a ten minute briefing by each of our speakers, after which we'll open up to Q and A. Um, so, introducing our speakers for today. Ambassador Mark Soffer is a member of the Israel Asia Center's Advisory Council. Uh, most recently, he served as Israel's ambas ambassador to Australia between 2017 and 2020. And prior to this, he served as the Deputy Director General and Head of Asia and the Pacific at the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, from 2007 to 2011, Ambassador Sofer was Israel's ambassador to India and non-resident ambassador to Sri Lanka. And during the course of his distinguished career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, other diplomatic posts he has held include Deputy Director General, uh, Head of Central Europe and uh, Eurasia Division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador of Israel to Ireland, Head of the Division for Middle Eastern Economic Affairs, uh, Deputy Consul General in New York, as well as posts uh, in Norway and Peru in the early 1990s. And he also served as policy advisor to then Foreign Minister Shimon Peres. Uh, Emmanuel Shachaf serves as CEO of Technology Asia Consulting. Uh, and is the vice chair of the Israel-Indonesia Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he's also a member of the Council for Peace and Security and is a member of the Israel, a board member of the Israel-Asia Chamber of Commerce and a program advisor to the Israel-Asia Center's Israel-Indonesia Futures Program. Uh, between 1979 and 1986, Mr. Shachaf served as a staff officer in the Israeli Air Force, and he then spent two years in the U.S. studying for an MBA. In 1989, he returned to Israel and joined the office of the Prime Minister in Tel Aviv, where he served in various positions, both in Israel and in Southeast Asia, until his retirement in 2003. He then worked to develop Israeli business relations with Indonesia and became politically active in the Israel Labour Party, competing for a place on Labour's Knesset list in 2012. Mr. Shachaf regularly contributes op-ed pieces to the Times of Israel, and in 2019, he published his biography, Identity, the Quest for Israel's Future. Uh, we're going to start with a briefing uh, by Ambassador Mark Sofer. Uh, Ambassador Sofer, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Unmute yourself. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rebecca. Uh, and I should perhaps uh, start by saying that despite the fact that I was uh, a, uh, a member of the, the Israeli uh, diplomatic corps for, for just under, for under 40 years, today I'm a uh, not, and I represent only myself, 
and uh, in fact, I'm uh, very critical of the present government and uh, uh, for a number of reasons that even pre that certainly preceded the uh, <coughs> the current uh, crisis, the current war. But now, of course, we all stand together uh, in unity uh, as we are faced with one of the biggest horrors, or perhaps the biggest horror we've had uh, since the founding of, uh, of the State of Israel in 1948. Now, um, I know that you've all been glued to your television sets for the last, uh, well, since the 7th of October, but nonetheless, a word or two about what actually has been going on, especially since I know that not all of the press reporting and not all of the media reporting has been 100% um, objective, uh, <clears throat> to say the least. Um, as you know, on the 7th uh, of October, over a thousand Hamas uh, jihadists, uh, terrorists really, uh, uh, came into the Israeli into Israeli territory, and went on can only be called an orgy of butchery, savagery, slaughter, killing, rape, uh, beheading, uh, burning alive of uh, um, entire families, uh, and. Now, I know that many of you haven't been uh, aware of what's going on. I don't want to go into too much of the horrible details of what's going on, but in order to understand uh, what had been going on, I could say the following thing on the 7th of uh, October. Uh, the Just about three days ago, the Israeli government showed about 100 of the foreign press situated here in Israel, some of the more, uh, some of the footage taken by Hamas themselves uh, during the uh, invasion or the, of these uh, Butchers on the seventh of uh, of October, uh, the the uh, footage was so gruesome that I can't go into too much detail, but I can say that some of the uh, journalists were physically sick, were vomiting, others fainted, uh, and uh, uh, they came out of there all of them in a state of utter and complete shock. Again, uh, in order to understand the depth of the horror. Uh, that uh, the hundreds of thousands of Israelis down in the south actually went through uh, such atrocities as uh, cutting over open a pregnant woman, pulling out the baby and beheading it, and then beheading her, shooting to, shooting a father in front of uh, his two sons, and then forcing them into the house, and then with the mother and burning the house down, uh, um, uh, beheading babies, uh, mass rape of uh, of uh, of, uh, and, and the list goes on and on. It's so awful. Uh, that I can't, uh, I can't describe it. Nobody can describe it. Uh, and last, but certainly, but not least, uh, the uh, brutal abduction of uh, 225 or 226 uh, uh, innocent people going around their daily lives, including babies who are still need of, uh, uh, who still can't eat, uh, still need milk. Uh, Ninety-year-old women uh, and things uh, and people of that nature and, and everything in between. 222 people are still languishing. Uh, in in Gaza, uh, under the uh, uh, sequestration, really of the of the Hamas. Uh, so this is the horror uh, that we've been through, and as a result of this horror, of this carnage, uh, of this butchery and savagery, we find ourselves at war. It's not a war that we wanted. It's not a war that we started, but it's a war that we will not and cannot, under any circumstances, lose. I think any single country in the world, every single country in the world, uh, would uh, uh, use the right to defend themselves, would take the uh, 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 initiative in order that such a horror should not just happen anymore with us, but shouldn't happen anymore anywhere else in the world. It's it's our right. Indeed, I would say it's our duty, and we will continue that duty uh, until the very end, until Hamas as a military force has been decimated to the extent that it doesn't exist anymore, and as a political force, uh, has no uh, command and no ruling over uh, over uh, the Gaza district, which is on our south. Uh, and those are the aims, strategic aims of the war, uh, which was thrust upon us. But not only that, of course, the freeing uh, and the release in the, the unconditional release of the two hundred and twenty uh, plus uh, hostages that were uh, that were take that were abducted really in such a brutal manner you know, on that day and the day after. Now, uh, the reasons why Hamas did uh, carried this out was not in order to get this state of Israel to disappear because that won't happen and they know they can't do it and they know that that won't be, th that the outcome of all of this will not be a Israeli defeat. The only reason that they carried out this slaughter, this butchery, this jihadist savagery uh, was in order to cause as much death, destruction 
and carnage as possible. There's no other reason for it. Uh, and this is the nature of jihad uh, movements, of extreme Islamism. And I make the enormous distinction between Islam and Islamism. To my mind, Islamism is a, a, of the sense of the, what the Hamas had done is an abuse uh, of Islam. It's a misuse of Islam. It's a disgrace to Islam. Uh, uh, and yet uh, these are the people who are working in the name of Islam and at the same time uh, uh, raping uh, thousands, hundreds and, and thousands of, of, of people, uh, uh, causing death and destruction uh, in, their, in their wake. So I, we don't equate this at all with Islam or with Muslims. The opposite is the case. It is Islamism rather than Islam. Um, now, a number of the, uh, I'd like to, a word or two really about, uh, in order to keep myself into the 10 minutes, a, a word or two really about the, the uh, uh, international press, if I might. Now, um, all international aspects in general, not just of the press. The, excuse me, even from stage one, even from the, the time that it was happening on the 7th of October, there were immediately, even before Israel had a chance, while we were still burying our dead, we were still reeling from the utter horror and the shock of the slaughter that we'd been through. There were already demonstrations in the streets of a number of cities throughout the world uh, uh, saying that this was justified, saying that you can do this, saying that there's no, that there's a, that, that uh, putting it to some sort of crazed lunatic perspective, which doesn't exist. Uh, under any circumstances, but that's what they were doing. These took the form in a number of cases of pure uh, unbridled anti-Semitism. We saw, for example, uh, a demonstration on the 8th uh, in Sydney before Israel had even uh, embarked on its uh, 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 strategic approach to dealing with the Hamas. The um, uh, screaming uh, 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 horde in Sydney calling for uh, the death of Jews. I won't use the expletives that they actually used around, around the world. Where posters carrying posters saying well, that we need the world clean of Jews, uh, pure unbridled anti-Semitism, not just in, in, in Sydney, but in certain cities in, in, in Europe, etc. Uh, which means, sadly, I have to say this, that even among uh, uh, populations uh, uh, such as your own or such as in, in Europe, there are uh, cells, there are bodies, there are throngs even in certain cases of people who support this type of butchery and this type of, of, of crazed, crazed murder. And this, to a certain extent, found its expression not uh, sometimes subconsciously, sometimes consciously in the international media. And they were too ready, in too often ready, to lap up the lies that were given to them uh, by the Hamas uh, uh, authorities. For example, let me use this as an example, but it's just one example. Uh, the Al, Al the Al Ahli Hospital in northern Gaza, which uh, suddenly one day, uh, I think it was on the fourth day of the of the fighting, the uh, Hamas came out and said five hundred people have been killed by an Israeli bomb on this hospital. Now, uh, uh, this was taken up and picked up by countless news services around the world. Nobody thought to question it. Nobody thought that why should a, a, a Hamas be lying? This was, I, I revert to saying that this was an organization that has just murdered 1,400 people. Why should they lie? Is really hard. Their last problem they have on their minds. Uh, it was even picked up by some of the Western media, such as the New York Times, the BBC, and basically portrayed as being uh, true that Israel had bombed this hospital. Uh, it turned out, and later the BBC, the New York Times, I don't think Al Jazeera, unfortunately, but okay. Uh, but others, uh, um, excuse me, um, uh, that others had uh, picked this up. Uh, that uh, they apologised for the reporting. They apologised for the uh, um, the way that it had been portrayed, and they said this wasn't happened. It was in fact a Hamas uh, uh, rocket that misfired, as indeed four hundred and fifty out of the almost 150,000 missiles that have been thrown at Israel indiscriminately over the past uh, two weeks. Uh, this was one which backfired. So it was them uh, uh, killing their own people in their own hospital. And I say that because under no circumstances ever does Israel and will Israel attack a hospital. And I said uh, any hospital, any medical facility whatsoever, because uh, uh, it is in, uh, entirely uppermost in our minds that any uh, uh, un uh, um, uh, involved civilian in Gaza who are not connected to the Hamas, as few as possible should be uh, should be hurt and, and, and injured. 
And the reason I say that, because we have our strategic aims, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which is to uh, uh, eradicate the Hamas as a military movement and to make sure it doesn't exist in the future as a political movement of any of any uh, uh, ruling force. We could achieve that aim in a couple of hours. Uh, we could achieve that aim without any ground uh, 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 invasion, without any movement of forces into Gaza uh, by troops, which actually endangers the troops tremendously, puts them in the line of fire uh, by uh, by uh, um, just aerial uh, activity. This would be the very, very last thing on our minds. The very last thing. We would never do that. And the reason that we would never do that is because we really are trying to limit collateral damage, trying to really limit the amount of uninvolved civilians that would be injured. That doesn't mean to say that we will be 100% successful. We won't be. This is a war that was thrust upon us and in war. Sadly, tragically, these things happen. Um, uh, but we will do our utmost even to put ourselves in danger uh, by trying to uh, uh, limit that as much as we possibly can. So you should know really and truly, despite what you may be reading, despite what you may be hearing, there is no thought whatsoever in Israel of indiscriminate targeting of anybody who is uninvolved with the Hamas. Yes, there is thought of eradicating the entire Hamas military leadership. I won't help hide that. Uh, they are hiding in tunnels uh, to a large extent under uh, the city. They, instead of using the money to build the schools, hospitals, uh, medical facilities or, or education or whatever, health, they have built an underground system of tunnels worthy, uh, which is really international in its, in its uh, sophistication. Uh, that's where the money has gone. The international money has gone. That's what they have done. Not a thought for the population. And we are insisting on calling for all uh, uh, citizens of the north of Gaza to move to the south so that we will not encounter any as few or we encounter as few civilians as possible. The Hamas is not only stopping them from or trying to stop them from reaching the south by putting up road blockades and by uh, um, um, physically uh, standing there and pushing them back. But there are now reports of them shooting at their own civilians in order to stop them from moving south. So we're taking all of that into consideration and we're trying to overcome the problem of the Hamas using their own people, not just us as human shields, but also to reach the strategic aim which we cannot fail uh, to achieve. We must not fail to achieve. And finally, a, a word, I think, if I might, uh, especially to you as Indonesians, um, you are a country with which we have a great deal of respect. We may not have official relationships. Uh, we may not be uh, um, in dialogue each and every day on an official level, but the respect in Israel for Indonesia, for Indonesian civilization, for its culture, for its moderation, for its leadership is, uh, you may not know this, but it's perhaps unparalleled in almost in any other country in the world. And uh, as a result of that, we know <clears throat> where you're coming from on a humanitarian uh, level, and we know or we believe strongly that you can do extre an extreme or use an extreme amount of influence to help on a humanitarian uh, um, uh, level only to release, uh, to facilitate the release of the hostages. Not only to facilitate their release, but they some of them are in need of medical equipment. Some have cancer. Some are autistic. Some are babies who are in need of, uh, of, of, of simple, basic food, staple uh, foodstuffs. Um, and of course, the release is first and foremost of the children, the elderly and the women, but uh, of course of everyone. Indonesia has a unique uh, uh, position in this, given its, its, uh, the, the, the respect that it garners in, in the Muslim world, in the Western world, and in Israel too. And I stress that. So if there's anybody here uh, that can find a way uh, to uh, to use Indonesian influence to facilitate the release of hostages, to facilitate uh, uh, this war crime, which it is, of, of uh, uh, um, taking innocent people and using them as human shields, uh, we would be eternally grateful to you. Uh, and uh, if any of you wish to do so behind the scenes and without uh, uh, international, without public then I can be contacted through Rebecca or however, uh, and I stand at your service. I am a senior member of the voluntary NGO uh, of the Forum for Missing Hostages and Families. And this is something which is absolutely uttermost and utmost in our, in our minds. I'll stop there and we'll take questions and answers, presumably, uh, hopefully, uh, after uh, Emmanuel has had, his, has had his say. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Mark. Um, Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you now, uh, Emmanuel, and then we'll open up uh, to Q and A. Hello, good evening. Uh, just like Mark said, uh, that after 40 years with the government, he became more more of like a member of the opposition. I'm also after 21 years with with the government. I'm more more with the opposition. But now we are all together in this in this uh, very very serious crisis, probably the worst crisis Israel has suffered uh, since exi its existence, um, because uh, the sneak attack on October seventh uh, had reverberations, which reminded us of things that happened in the Holocaust. So uh, this is something that should never have happened. I'll show you what happened on the ground on the seventh of October uh, on the slides which I'll share now in right, just a moment. First, I'll we'll see the picture. This is this is Israel, as you can see. I, you can see here the West Bank area in green, the Gaza Strip down here in green, the, the border to Lebanon, which isn't isn't quiet either. Okay, we have not we have a problem here at the Gaza Strip, where we, where the sneak attack started on October 7th. We have a problem here uh, along the border with Lebanon, where Hezbollah is shooting from time to time and sending people into the shelters. And we have a problem in the West Bank, where both uh, the Palestinians are acting up and also uh, some of our settlers are, are doing their share to keep this, uh, uh, this area uh, un at unrest. So we have a potentially a three front situation. Uh, so let's look at, at the Gaza, uh, at the Gaza Strip, hold up. Oh, just hold on. Uh, here's the Gaza Strip. This area is about 300, 380 square kilometers, about 45 kilometers long, 20, 15 kilometers wide. And uh, on average, uh, on the 7th of, of October, on Saturday morning, uh, they started about 6.30 with a very, very strong rocket bombardment of the whole of Israel. Actually, I, I live here in the center of the, I live in the center of the country and, and I was, there was an alarm in our area, but most of the effort was concentrated on the area around the Gaza Strip. Uh, all these settlements, the black, these black settlements are all civilian settlements with a few army bases interspersed. Um, the attack came at 10 places across the border with Gaza here and at 10 different places. They uh, surprised, they surprised the army, which was really literally caught, caught uh, pants down. And um, most of the attack was direct against civilians, as, as Mark said. Uh, they did terrible carnage to uh, our civilian settlements, most of the kibbutzim. There are several 10,000 settlers here, uh, not settlers, but uh, the people who live here in the kibbutzim. And uh, the border uh, uh, was breached again in the end at up to 80 places. Uh, and it took the army uh, until Monday to get all the invaders out. Now you can see here the red the red line, markation line is the line which marks the, the penetration uh, of the uh, terrorists into Israel. Here, uh, unfortunately, there was a, a, a big festival going on, which it, uh, which had several thousand participants in this area here in the middle, and they were caught in the attack, and m many of them were were killed and butchered by uh, by the terrorists. So that's uh, the geopolitical situation. So let's go. Let me stop sharing. Okay. And now, what situation do we find ourselves in? We're uh, basically uh, now trying to pursue our aims, our strategic aims that Mark explained in the Gaza Strip, which is uh, eliminating Hamas which hasn't been done before. And I don't think every, anybody really knows how to do that, but it probably will mean that we have to enter the, the Gaza Strip. And today uh, we, it was announced already that Israeli forces are operating within the Gaza Strip with tanks and uh, other things. 
uh, I, I forgot to show you something that I wanted to to show on the on the Gaza map. Hold it. Just a moment. Uh, this this line here is the line between north nor, northern Ga part of the Gaza Strip and the southern part of the Gaza Strip. This is the line here beyond which Gaza Gazans are safe. So this is is Israel is is uh, asking the population of Gaza to move into that area, which is accessible from Egypt and where there's uh, hum humanitarian supplies can be provided to the area. Okay, this is just for your, for your information. Go back. Um, so uh, this is the situation that right now. We're bombing in Gaza. We're uh, still warning of bombs ahead of time in order to prevent major collateral damage. Um, at the same time, we're preventing, we're trying to keep the fires low because we're worried that the north of Israel will be involved in uh, in war with Hezbollah, which is also one of the reasons the United States have been have become involved because they want to prevent Iranian involvement. We have a huge hostage crisis, which is very very problematic for Israel. Uh, Israelis are extremely concerned about their hostages, but not understandably, and they're also. Uh, for quite a lot of foreigners involved. There are dozens of foreigners who are among the uh, among the hostages. Uh, um, so that hostage crisis is also has to be taken into consideration when when there's any military moves. Um, there's a huge economic burden on Israel at this time. We have about three hundred fifty thousand soldiers under arms right now. Which is just just keeping them on just keeping them on reserve duty is about a hundred million dollars a day, not to talk about the impact to the economy, which is projected to lose about eighteen percent on the on a yearly basis in the first quarter of two thousand twenty four. So that's going to count in also. Uh, the, the other problem is the West Bank, which I said is, is acting up quite quite substantially. Uh, mainly because of uh, also caused by the by the settlers, but also caused by the, by terrorists in uh, uh, under under the Palestinian Authority. Uh, so uh, we have our work cut out for us, uh, and it's clear clear that you know the fact that we are a very strong country militarily cannot come to be, cannot come to bear to the extent we we like it to. In because of humanitarian concerns. Um, so uh, one other factor we have to keep in mind is the, the Israel, Israeli Arab population, which so far has been completely loyal, I and mean, there haven't been any problems. Uh, but if uh, the situation in the West Bank starts to act up further, and, and if the war starts to become more intensive than it is now, uh, we cannot exclude that that may also be a front a problem and and that's a considerable problem. So we have to work hard, keep our fingers crossed. We hope for uh, international pressure to move towards some kind of agreement that lets the hostages out. Uh, the US government is putting a lot of pressure on our government uh, for several reasons in order first of all to prevent uh, the war of, of getting uh, extending further. Expanding further, the, the U.S. have forces in the area, and they have to protect these forces before that before anything can happen. Uh, they also don't trust the Israeli government and want to have, have keep a close tab on what we do. So this is also uh, weighing in. So all things considered, this is I think uh, uh, the worst situation, the worst uh, crisis Israel has been in since its existence. And the worst casualties and the, the most terrible uh, carnage has, that has ever been caused to us. It's a, a lot worse than the Yom Kippur War in 1973, which was mainly uh, affected the army and not so much the civilian population. In this case, uh, the civilian population was very, very badly hit, uh, evoking memories of, this, of the Holocaust, something that should have never happened in Israel. And uh, so we have to take it from there. So thank you, I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, so uh, I'm going to open up to uh, Q&A now. I'm just going to uh, enable the Q&A. 
Um, and um, you're free. Uh, I'd like to invite the uh, audience to post questions. Um, if um, we won't mention your name and who's asked the question unless you post your name uh, just before your question. So if you'd like us to mention your name, just post your name before the question. Uh, otherwise, we'll just read your question. Um, so um, just to um, just now enabled the chat. And I see that um, there are um, some questions uh, coming in. Um, so okay. Okay, so we have a question um, asking if uh, the attack has any correlation uh, with the uh, normalization plan uh, with Saudi Arabia and other uh, Middle Eastern countries, um, uh, after which Indonesia might follow. Um, and if yes, who are, uh, who are those who really benefited or most benefited from this chaos? Um, perhaps, um, um, perhaps Mark, uh, you could uh, address this question first. Well, I, I think, uh, uh, yes, the answer is that it certainly had certain input into the, uh, uh, into the Hamas uh, um, calculations, but I wouldn't place it at the top of the Hamas calculations. I think at the top of the calculations of Hamas was the uh, just bestial slaughter of a jihadist movement. Uh, um, which uh, was maybe received a bit of a spur or a bit of a trigger from the normalization that's been going on uh, between Israel and uh, uh, quite a large part of the Arab world. Uh, as you know, we've already had relations between Egypt with Egypt and with Jordan for some time, ongoing negotiations with the Palestinians. And to that was added the UAE, Morocco uh, and Bahrain. Uh, and in the wings, uh, much uh, has been talked about uh, with Saudi Arabia. Now, uh, it's important to note that uh, the, that Hamas jihadism, in fact, uh, this extremism of this butchery anywhere in the Arab world is as much a threat, or is also a threat, not as much a threat, is also a threat uh, to the Arab world itself. Uh, we saw how Egypt dealt with the Muslim Brotherhood under Morsi. We saw how uh, 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 how the, the what is happening in the fear of Iranian hegemony, hegemony in, or we see that in in the Gulf world, uh, which feeds in to a certain extent to a Sunni Shia problem. But nonetheless, uh, the Iranians are vastly and strongly behind not only the Hezbollah, which is a Shia organization in Lebanon, but also the Hamas, which is a a, a Sunni uh, movement uh, in Gaza. And yet the hatred of Iran, the viciousness uh, um, towards uh, Israel uh, from the Iranian regime. And I make and I'm very strong to make the, dis to the distinction between the Iranian people on the one hand, who are erudite, intelligent, uh, clever and certainly not extreme. And the Iranian primitive uh, regime, the government of the Ayatollahs, which is a throwback to medieval times which I'm sure very few Indonesians, in fact, very few people around the world can relate to, uh, they are behind uh, um, this uh, horror that we saw on the 7th of October, and they are behind the Hezbollah. Uh, it, what you see an Iranian figure, actually anywhere in the Middle East, you see an Iranian hand, uh, anywhere where there's instability, if it's in Iraq, if it's in Yemen, if it's in, uh, even in as far as the Western Sahara, <coughs> excuse me, in Morocco. And so what we are seeing here is, is a... Uh, definite attempt, part of the attempt to start to, that this uh, um, uh, normalization, if you will, between Israel and the Arab world uh, uh, shouldn't continue. I'm not sure, uh, actually, I don't think that they will be successful in any way because of what I said, because of the anathema of many, many of the forward looking uh, uh, Arab and Muslim regimes, uh, um, governments in the world, uh, the, their anathema they, that these governments hold towards Hamas. Uh, which they don't see as being anything representative about themselves. And, and I'm taking aside, actually, right now, some of the statements that are made inside of the Arab world. There's a lot of uh, internal considerations to be made. There's a lot of feeling 
that Israel should be very careful about its uh, uh, approach towards the Palestinian people. And actually, I can understand that, uh, that feeling, that approach. Uh, but to equate the Palestinian people with Hamas and to equate the ha Hamas with the Palestinian people, very, very few, very, few, if any, are doing it only uh, uh, jihadist supporters uh, in uh, in Hamas, in Hezbollah, in Iran, and in certain cities throughout Europe and uh, uh, and and uh, others like Malaysia, actually. So it's very, very uh, uh, difficult. It's very complex. The answer is yes, but uh, for the time being, it, it it will have a stop on the the continuation of the normalization. But in the long run, I I would like to hope. I don't know yet what's going to pan out in this war. Uh, that it won't have a long-term effect. Um, thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Would you like to add something? To yeah, that? I, I just want to like I, I, my, I think my response differs slightly from from Marx in the sense that I think the normalization of Saudi Arabia was very much on 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 the uh, on the Hamas minds when they went into this. Uh, in general, the uh, not only the normalization, but the, they wanted to wipe wipe out the status quo. I think that was that is clear, clear that uh, that uh, so many years of uh, of a situation which didn't move anywhere for the Palestinians uh, and Hamas decided to 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 break the uh, to break it and use the opportunity of the normalization with uh, with Saudi Arabia as uh, as the event uh, to to take to handle and to to dispose of. And they did that, and the fact they did that with uh, particular savagery and butchery and carnage uh, was mo more to to uh, to uh, to cause us uh, to lose our 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 balance. It was it's clearly uh, uh, was impacted Israel in a way which which Israel hasn't been impacted before. Be again, because of the terrible imagery of what happened about the, the carnage of one thousand four hundred citizens. Who were peaceful in their in their homes and were were killed and murdered and, and so on. Uh, they uh, the Hamas definitely wanted us to uh, to act uh, respond in an irrational way and maybe cause ourselves damage in in the long run. So yes, uh, I think the idea of uh, impacting a normalization with the Arab countries played a, a big role and and more so the to try to try to stop the status quo as the way it has been handled in the last 50 years. Thank you. Can I add, uh, uh, Rebecca, please, to, to what Amano has just said? Again, he may be correct, and I, I don't know uh, when the, we're in the realm of uh, speculation or analysis, which could be correct or incorrect. And uh, uh, But, but it, whatever the case may be, we both agree that uh, that there was an input of that, uh, How the question of how large the input was. Of, but I want to add a word or two, if I might, about Indonesia and Israel, which was also part of the question, if I if I understood correctly. Now, in my belief, uh, and I've been studying and reading and watching Indonesia for many, many years now, uh, um, uh, long before I was uh, even uh, dealing with it uh, as an Asia expert, uh, I do believe uh, that the relationship between Indonesia and Israel, the formal relationship today, is a bit of an anomaly. Uh, we have relations with so many Muslim countries in the world. We have relations with so many of the Arab world, which are directly involved in the Middle East. And we do understand Indonesia's approach uh, to the Palestinian cause. And I'll be even I'll go even one stage further. I firmly believe that the vast majority, I think that's also borne out by fact, the vast majority of Israelis uh, won't dis differ from the uh, Indonesian approach of a two state solution, uh, Israel on one side, Palestine on the other side living side by side. That's to differ between the mass carnage and the, the destruction and the support of the, uh, the, the the worst extremists imaginable. I do think that there's an anomaly there. Uh, uh, I do think that it needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, and I do think also, though, that this hasn't even for one iota harmed the respect uh, that we have here in Israel uh, for, for Indonesia, as I said earlier, for Indonesia, its culture, its leadership, etc. So if we could address that later down the line uh, in the context of the normalization in the Arab with the Arab world, with the context of the normalization, uh, that Indonesia can play a greater role in bringing about world peace uh, and harmony, then I would be the first to go out in the streets and dance. Just a, just a small add-on. I think we have to look at the, 
the difference between normalization with the governments and normalization with the people. And normalization so far has been clearly been with the, with the governments and not with the people. And as long as the, the people's concerns in, in the Arab countries who are firmly with the Palestinians are not addressed, uh, I think it'll be very difficult uh, to continue along the path of normalization. Um, so we have lots of questions coming in. Uh, one of the questions is, what do you think the um, um, the anticipated duration of this situation is? And is there a possibility of it persisting for an extended period akin to the situation that transpired in Ukraine? Who are you asking? Um, um, Mark. Important to say that, uh, Rebecca. So we don't have this clause. The uh, the um, uh, the likelihood is that uh, it will be protracted. I mean, I'm not a military expert, uh, but in order to achieve an aim, a strategic aim, which is an aim which I must say is shared not just by Israel but by the United States and by many, by many, as I said earlier, of the forward-looking countries uh, in the Middle East and outside it, which is the decimation of Hamas. <laughs> excuse me as a, a military force and as a political leadership in uh, in 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 the uh, in the Gaza area in the Gaza strip uh, i don't expect it to be a quick in and out within the, it, it will be long it will be protracted will it resemble uh, the uh, russian onslaught on ukraine uh, i don't believe it will I, we don't have any wish for that uh, and if we can achieve our strategic aim uh, quicker and faster and uh, as quickly as possible, that would be, uh, that would be, of course, vastly preferable to a prolonged conflict on the one hand. Uh, it would also reduce the amount of uh, 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 uninvolved casualties. I should say that even as we talk, everyone talks, of course, of nonstop of, uh, and rightly so, from their point of view of, of what's happening in Gaza, uh, but something in the region of uh, uh, a thousand rockets in the last three days, a thousand missiles have been fired indiscriminately from Gaza into Israeli villages and towns. Uh, hostels have been destroyed. Nobody talks about those, of course, uh, um, but uh, uh, it has happened and uh, uh, we've evacuated, we had to evacuate hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people uh, from the south, from their homes, uh, the quicker they, uh, uh, not only from the destroyed uh, kibbutzim and the uh, villages of which they were, uh, uh, which were so da dangerously damaged uh, to the point of not being livable uh, anymore, but also to those who have been under constant fire for the last 12, 20 days by indiscriminate missiles. So the quicker this is over, the better. But I think that we should be under no illusion uh, that it's going to happen uh, with a sort of a, fl uh, a flick of the fingers. It's not going to be. It'll be unfortunately longer. And we have the hostage issue to be dealing with at exactly the same time. I, I, I think... I, I, yeah. Uh, I think that it will be extend, extended. It can't be that. It can't be. Uh, it can't approach the uh, what's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, it just it just cannot uh, because the situation on the ground is too dear for the for the humanitarian situation in Gaza is is is, uh, is bad enough for it to be shortened considerably by uh, influence of the United States and and other countries. Which will put their power to bear in order to, to make this conflict shorter. In addition, uh, there will be considerable pressure on the government of Israel uh, to shorten this conflict. And I, I think what will shorten it tremendously will be uh, success with the hostage negotiations. If we can get the hostage situation uh, off off the table quickly, the the uh, the war will be will be shortened. And we have to keep our we have to keep in mind that uh, as long as it's only uh, uh, only in the north, and there is no war in this in in only in the south, and there's no war, uh, accompanying war in, this, in the north, uh, we're uh, we we can shorten this considerably. And I think that's everybody's interest, and we have to keep that in mind. We have no interest in, in prolonging this conflict. Uh, but uh, there's too many factors which are not in, uh, under our control. But it won't be like Ukraine, definitely not. Uh, I see a lot of questions coming in. I want to try to uh, address as many of them as possible. Um, and another question someone has posted here, um, uh, they ask, you know, the hospital that um, that uh, you you talked about earlier, uh, they asked if, the, if Israel has shown irrefutable evidence that the hospital bombing was not 
carried out by Israeli force. There's no and, such thing as sorry. Yes, please. There's no such thing as what kind of evidence you can't show evidence of something that didn't happen. Okay, all let's say that all the evidence, all the evidence that has been produced so un, until now indicates that it wasn't Israel. There's been no no evidence produced that indicates that it was Israel. But you can't go beyond that. There has, has to be a limit somewhere. Okay, and that's the situation now. There will be situations where the situation is 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 clear or or, or and where it's not clear. In this situation, it's, it's as as clear as it can be under a wartime situation with constant uh, bombings going on. That apparently it was not Israel. Okay, it's maybe may difficult to to grasp for some people who had their mindset that it is Israel, but it wasn't Israel for at least not according to the evidence. So if you believe it, fine. If you don't believe it, it's just your choice. Can I add to that, uh, Emmanuel, uh, sure. uh, if I might, and Rebecca? Uh, Emmanuel is right, of course. You can't prove that something uh, didn't happen. Uh, it, it wasn't us. It's like I was saying that, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's an impossible thing to do. However, uh, as Emmanuel said, all available evidence uh, is completely and utterly unequivocal. And that, that evidence is the follows. Uh, they have uh, video footage. It's open. It's clear of a, a series of missiles being shot from about 100 meters away from the hospital, including one which fell directly on the hospital. Uh, it backfired and it fell directly from the Hamas. That's number one. Number two, uh, uh, we have a telephone uh, uh, um, reporting of two Hamas uh, operatives, two Hamas uh, terrorists talking to each other, uh, uh, saying that, oh my goodness, we have to blame Israel quickly uh, because otherwise uh, the truth will come out and they'll see that it was us, uh, it was a backfire dropping from us. But most damningly of all, if you ask me from the, from the evidence that is there, is that all footage and not just Israeli footage by any means, but Al Jazeera satellite footage, uh, and even uh, Hamas footage on the ground taken by, by health workers, etc. There is no crater. There is no hole. In other words, a, a bomb which is fired from an aeroplane causes a crater. Uh, uh, but when a missile backfires, it just sets a light uh, what it backfires on. And there is no crater there to be seen, not from satellite systems, not Israeli, from international. So you have on the one hand these three or four or five evidence, which may not be irrefutable. You can argue, and if somebody decides that Israel's talking nonsense, they will decide that anyway. But facing that, you have Hamas saying it was Israel, uh, and so you have one with evidence, uh, 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 strong evidence, saying uh, showing that it wasn't, and of course our denial that it was, and the other, Hamas uh, saying, without showing anything at all, that it was Israeli uh, Israeli uh, uh, attack. It wasn't. And so the bottom line of it all is that anyone chooses to take the word, the unproven word of a jihadist terrorist organization, which has just finished carnage on 40 and massacred 1400 people against proof, which you could argue with if you want, because uh, if you decided that in advance, then so be it. We can't convince everybody all the time. Uh, and we do also in, in, in life make mistakes. We're not superhuman. We are uh, human beings trying to defend our country against uh, maniacs, perhaps half drugged maniacs, actually, uh, um, uh, pouring in and, and massacring us. And uh, uh, sometimes in conflict situations, uh, any country would make a mistake. And Indonesia knows that from its past and other countries know that from its past. But to say that we are doing this discriminately, uh, indiscriminately and firing, that really is for me a shame that people would say that. But as I said at the very beginning, even before we responded, people were saying Israel is to be destroyed. Uh, Israel has to be, uh, it's okay to rape women. Uh, it's okay to behead babies. And so there's really uh, always that will be in the in the air and we'll, we've learned to live with that over the years. Um, there's a question here um, about Israel-Indonesia relations. Um... The, one of the participants asks, many Indonesian figures suggest that Indonesia open relations with Israel so that Indonesia can then participate in peace efforts between Israel and Palestine. What do you think? Um, 
sorry, uh, Emmanuel, do you want to take this first? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I've been talking to Indonesians, uh, to high level people uh, for quite a while and in telling them to them if they want to get involved in Israel's Palestinian peace, they should establish relations with Israel, which uh, uh, they haven't selected to do that. Uh, and uh, this is a situation as, as good a, an opportunity as good as ever. But uh, what I think what is riding the the Indonesian situation, the Indonesian uh, considerations is mostly the the backing of the people for the Palestinian cause. So unless you have a very you have a very strong uh, president uh, who is firmly established in his position, uh, uh, who, who will make the move and will say. We we have to you know weigh in on this. We're we're a, 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 almost a world power, and uh, we are uh, we have very good relations with Middle Eastern countries, and we can provide uh, a, a lot of input to uh, the peace uh, the peace process. Uh, he has to take a lot of risks from uh, from the opposition, and uh, you know we've been disappointed again and again. We, before the next president comes in, we're all hopeful that when the president comes in, he'll make make a move towards Israel. And then when he's in his, he doesn't. And then when he's in his last year, we say he's got nothing to lose. Maybe he'll do it now. And then he doesn't. And then the same thing happens with the next president. So my hopes aren't very high, uh, in particular because uh, uh, the situation in, in the the situation inside Indonesia. Uh, could be uh, stability could be threatened by uh, if, if the people uh, weigh in strongly and they will weigh in strongly in favor of the Palestinians and they don't see uh, this uh, situation where Indonesia should establish relations with Israel because of that. So uh, we just have to wait and see how this plays out and hope for the best. I I, uh, I will add a little bit, if I could, to what uh, Emmanuel just said. I think there are three parts to this. First of all, uh, uh, I agree with what he said earlier in that uh, relations between two countries are not only official relations, but they also are people-to-people -people relations, uh, industry, science, sharing of uh, know-how, uh, university, academic, press-to-press, -press, people to people is very, very important indeed. Number two, as I said earlier, Israel-Indonesian relations are an anomaly. Not only is it good for... Uh, I must say, I think for Indonesia as one of the world's great powers, uh, when they cut themselves off from 50% of the world's, one of the world's greatest conflicts, I don't think it helps, or one of the most intractable or, or difficult conflicts, I don't think it helps Indonesia's, uh, it doesn't show Indonesia to be a, 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 in, in the superpower mold, that they're all close to superpower mold that they really uh, should be in, both as an economy, as a, as a size of the country, etc. But third of all, and this is for me most important, if for most important, I think that Indonesia can play a serious role in helping us. We also need the help, uh, and our uh, Palestinians need the help in helping us solving our problems. And that is perhaps at the bottom of it all. Uh, uh, we have, as I said earlier, the most enormous amount of respect for Indonesia. There is no disrespect and there is no problem whatsoever that Indonesia has taken hook, line and sinker the Palestinian uh, cause as its cause celebra. Not at all. We have relations and strong and good relations with countries which are much uh, more pro-Palestinian even than Indonesia uh, um, and with Muslim countries, etc. Uh, and I think that being pro-Palestinian doesn't necessarily mean you're anti-Israeli by any means. And as I said, and I repeat it again, the vast majority of us in Israel understand and respect and actually agree with uh, Indonesia's approach uh, to the solution in the Middle East, which is two states of Israel and, and Palestine living side by side. And so, yes, it's an anomaly. And yes, it needs to be changed. Can it be changed now when the war is going on? Ah. But uh, when the war is over and we've moved into a different mode and the mode perhaps of, of trying to think what next and what should we be doing to get to, to, to free ourselves of this horror of the conflict, both sides, Indonesia needs to understand, I, I say that in not in a condescending way, that its role that can be played is almost indispensable. It's extremely important for both sides and we will welcome it despite its approach and despite its support or for the it, it, for the Palestinians, which is, is accepted by many, uh, it can play a crucial role and an important role in bringing Israel and Palestine uh, together. And that's why I do believe, for all those reasons and more, that anything that we can do 
to uh, to move this process along uh, would be a boon for everybody. Um, I'm trying to try to fit in two more questions uh, before the end of this webinar. Uh, the first is uh, many pro-Palestinian supporters in Indonesia compare the Pal Palestine's resistance uh, to their own war with the Netherlands. How can we discuss it and give ample evidence to the vast difference between the two historical events? Uh, Emmanuel, would you like to address that? Uh, actually, I was hoping you were going to ask Mark. But <laughs> we can ask Mark. <laughs> on, on this one, because I, I don't remember the, 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 the historical details of the uh, of the Dutch uh, colonial. No, I think I think the, the Dutch were uh, at, at the time uh is in, in against the, the united nations when it when they returned to uh to the former colony in uh, in indonesia uh so it's, just, it's it's difficult to compare the two situations uh, uh israel doesn't see itself and it definitely is not a colonial power in palestine okay we uh, we have uh uh, historical uh, uh, connection to the country, so it's, it's not as we we came of, we, we came from, from out of nowhere and, and wanted to colonize Palestine. So that's the the major the, the major difference. Okay, the Dutch had no business in being in Indonesia. They had no connection to Indonesia. They came and colonized Indonesia for four hundred years and created some terrible carnage. And uh, and then when they were uh, politely asked to 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 leave, they, they didn't want to, which which I understand. But uh, uh, we are not in the same situation. We are not a colonial power. And that's I think one of the biggest problems many Palestinians have with the way they're looking at it. They look at us as a colonial power, but we're not. Okay, we, you, you, there are certain aspects of what we do which are which may remind people of colonialism, but we're our our connection to the country is to the to the land is firm, and it's just as firm as that of the Palestinians. Okay, or just as firm or not firm. So so that that's a, a huge difference, and the the world community recognized that when it. Uh, went for the partition decision, the uh, partition uh, resolution in 1947, and uh, split the land into two: one part for Israel and the, and the other part for the Palestinians. Something the Palestinians refused to accept at the time, and still have difficulty with. So we're still in that situation where we we are uh, fighting over a piece of land which already has been uh, has been. Uh, decided to, that it should be, belong to both of us, part part of it to Israel, part of it to Palestine, and we have to get our act together. Okay, so that's what I have to say on this. Mark, Just to add something? a word or yeah. two about that, uh, uh, Rebecca. Um, as you know, Israel uh, not only doesn't uh, occupy Gaza, but it actually, uh, Gaza was ruling itself, been ruling itself now for well over 20 years or more. Uh, uh, that's number one. And number two, as Emmanuel said, and quite clearly, uh, Israel agrees, and the vast body politic, the majority, except for the extreme right in Israel, agreed that there has to be two states sitting side by side, Israel and Palestine. I was the advisor of Shimon Peres uh, during the Oslo Accords when we uh, recognized the Palestinian right to two states, we agreed to it, we spoke to the PLO, etc. It didn't work out for a number of reasons, including a reason inside of Israel, as, as you will recall, uh, Prime Minister Rabin was uh, assassinated by a fanatical uh, a fascist thug, I have no other words to call him, uh, and that was one of the main reasons, why, or one of the serious reasons why it went downhill. So no, we have no uh, 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 wish to be uh, any type of uh, colonization. We have no wish to prevent, the majority of us, no wish to prevent the establishment of the Palestinian state side by side, but we will not and we cannot uh, accept that uh, uh, Palestine will come in place of Israel. That is suicidal. Uh, um, I don't I don't believe that anyone and certainly it's not Indonesian policy, the policy of the Indonesians that we will accept. OK, let's disappear from the face of the earth and from the river to the sea, as you hear all over the place. Palestine will be free, which basically means from the Mediterranean until the Jordan River, uh, there will be no Israel. And, and that is not something which is which is plausible, palpable and certainly certainly won't happen. I also would like to say that despite the trials and the tribulations that the Indonesians went through uh, under uh, Dutch occupation. Uh, I don't recall 
hundreds or thousands of, uh, I don't recall because it didn't happen, thousands of Indonesians uh, taking to the streets and burning families alive, Dutch families alive, slaughtering uh, uh, innocent men, women and children, massacring over four, you know, thousands and thousands of people in their beds. Take uh, That didn't happen because we're not dealing here with a liberation movement. <clears throat> we're not dealing here with somebody who wants to live side by side, or with a group that wants to live side by side with Israel. We're talking here of a savage group of butchers infused with uh, hate, destruction, uh, and basically the dissipation of the state of Israel. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to get to all the questions uh, that have been posted here, but I would just like to end with um, this one last question. Uh, we have somebody in the group who um, has said, you know, many Indonesians actually uh, shared Israelis' grievances against Islamist radicalism. However, it isn't easy uh, for them, uh, for Indonesians, to uh, publicly express their sympathy with Israel uh, because of uh, due to radical threats that they might face. Um, given the sensitivities involved, what do you think are the best possible ways for improving Indonesia-Israel relations? Um, Emmanuel. Uh, I think uh, much of what Rebecca is doing is exactly that, working on in, in, in the civil society expanding the relations, the, the indirect relations to both NGOs talking to each other, and of course, commercial commercial ties, which fortunately have been going on for, for many, many years and are expanding, they could be expanding even more, that will eventually deliver. Uh, so uh, that, I think that's, that's what we have to, we have to keep doing what we're doing, um, exp expand the relations in the civil, in civil society, uh, through communal action uh, between uh, action activities between uh, communities in Israel and between communities in uh, in Indonesia and and again the the uh, the commercial relations there is a huge huge potential there okay right now the commercial relations are maybe to the tune of a half a billion dollars a year uh, when you compare that to what we have with Turkey with with a country we, we have diplomatic relations with, but not particularly good relations. Okay, we have $6 billion worth of uh, trade going both directions. That, that's with Turkey, which is a country much smaller than in, in Indonesia. So the potential with Indonesia is, is really, really huge both ways. Uh, and uh, it reminds us that there's a lot of work to do, uh, which can be done beyond uh, diplomatic relations and out of the limelight also. Uh, and again, the the between the community communities, I think that's uh, that's uh, along the things that Rebecca does already. Uh, I think that's very it's very important. Yeah, uh, if I can add a few words here, I think uh, um, uh, it's important to 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 mention that Indonesia has a free press, and if um, we're asked in a free public opinion, you can express yourself. It's not a uh, uh, it's not I don't know. I'll be open. It's not China. It's not North Korea by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the opening of the press to different points of view and not to just the one sided block view that Israel is the be all and end all of all evil, which it certainly isn't, doesn't make us into supermen and women, but we're certainly not the be all and end all, the id, the credo of being everything that is hateful in the world. The opposite is the case. We have contributed so much to international civilization and society for a country of our size. And I think that the opening of the media is important. I agree entirely with Emmanuel uh, that uh, uh, commercial relations, trade relations, but I don't think it stops there. And I will be a little bit uh, self-centered, if I might be, for a moment. I, I don't mean this in any patronizing or, or, or condescending way because I'm not that type of person. But I do also believe that Indonesia has something to gain, a lot to gain from a relationship with Israel. Uh, in the field of technology, in the field of water management, in the field of agriculture, in the fields of which Israel is really the world's leader or among the world leaders, which we would so much like to impart uh, to Indonesia. It's such a huge country with so many intelligent and good people uh, that we could do that, which has made that much more difficult in the fact that we can't get in, really, uh, that we have no 
that, that it's very difficult for this people to people relationship to move forward. So all in all, all around, there are there are lots that uh, uh, Indonesians can do. You petition politicians, press, social media, uh, uh, etc. And yes, be critical of Israel. We need criticism. I honestly mean that. We need criticism, especially from friends. Um, uh, not just uh, if if, if uh, Iran comes out and criticizes Israel, it means nothing to us. But when when people and and and, and countries which are civilized, forward-looking, moderate, come out and say that Israel should do A, B, and C instead of D, E, and F. We listen, and we aren't superhuman, we aren't perfect, and we do try to correct our ways uh, if that's necessary. No, no country is, and we are no different from any other country. I uh, just, just want to add uh, uh, that, uh, again, the, the, like Mark indicated, the press has an important role to play here. Uh, I think the press is, is not covering Israel the way it should be. It's, it's not covering Israel at all. And if it covers Israel, it covers it in, 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 in a not uh, even-handed way, which is understandable. Okay, but, uh, but there should, there's a, a, a wide range of uh, publications in Indonesia, and they should, they should come here and, and, and look for themselves more than anything else and not not you know just uh, use the information that they've been provided by arab stations and, and, uh, and arab elements so i i invite there they may be members of the press uh, on this uh, we webinar i invite them to to come here and see for themselves and and have a look at it and and publish what they see because it's worthwhile thank you I'd also just like to add, um, just from the perspective of the Israel Asia Center, in terms of um, uh, ways to improve uh, Israel-Indonesia relations, uh, the Israel Asia Center is engaged in a number of initiatives uh, to do just that. Some of them uh, we're very open about, some of them less open. Um, and uh, if you go to our website, um, you can see at least some ways uh, to get involved in that. Uh, certainly as participants on our Israel Indonesia Futures program, uh, but also uh, for business people, there are other ways as well to engage between the two countries. There's tremendous untapped potential between Israel and Indonesia in a range of areas and, and so much uh, uh, scope for cooperation in education, in uh, different areas of tech, such as mobility uh, and EVs, uh, clean tech, agri tech, water tech, uh, healthcare and med tech um, and, um, and, and, and in so many other areas. And um, I really would encourage you uh, to reach out either to the Israel Asia Center uh, with regards to our Indonesia pro Israel Indonesia programs or uh, to Emmanuel um, if you're uh, looking at doing business uh, between the two countries uh, within the, uh, under the umbrella and if he can help under the umbrella of the Israel Indonesia Chamber of Commerce. Um, so lots of ways to engage uh, and to do so quietly even, uh, but still very successfully. Um, so I really do encourage you uh, to reach out to us. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry we've run a little bit over time here. Thank, and I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of your questions. If you have any other questions, please, uh, please do reach out to us uh, over email or through our website. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.